morning, everyone out there. Thanks for joining us in our virtual format and tuning in to our third live webinar. I'm Jill Miranda Baker, Executive Director of Keys History and Discovery Center. Six feet away from me is Aaron Muir, Manager of Membership and Events and Tech Guru, as well as Brad Bertelli, tonight's presenter. While we miss seeing everyone, we are so happy to have the ability and your interest to continue our lecture series almost as planned in this new medium. While the museum remains closed, we continue providing you with some distractions during this unprecedented time. Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m., Brad goes live on Facebook, and on Mondays at 1 p.m., Lake Terry with Moat Marine and our resident aquarium biologist goes live. This Friday, we're adding a World Trip Fridays featuring a different historical point of interest. You don't need to be a Facebook user to tune in to any of the above. In your search bar, just type Florida Keys History and Discovery Center on Facebook and our page should appear. Additionally, starting on when, next Wednesday, May 6th, we add cocktails with the curator, allowing for an open Q&A video session with Brad. These sessions will occur the first and third Wednesdays at 5 p.m. through Zoom platform. This program does have limited ca capacity. Advanced registration is required at keysdiscovery.com back, backsplash virtual programs. We are launching one more new program in May, Community Views, on Wednesday, May 27th at 5 p.m. This is a narrated pictorial presentation sharing photos of early days in Upper Keys communities. Historic Tavernier is the first area Brad will explore in this new series. Wednesday, May 13th concludes our scheduled spring lecture series with the topic of environmental threats to Florida's iconic crustaceans presented by a moat marine scientist. We are exploring offering lectures in June and July. While we have switched to a virtual format, support is still needed to continue offering lectures which provide a unique opportunity for cultural enrichment and engagement through the expertise of renowned authors, professors, historians, and scientists. Please consider, if you are able, to lend your support for the continuation of lectures and all of the new virtual programming that is helping us share our mission both here in our community and across the virtual world. Donations can be made direct from our website at keysdiscovery.com backslash support. We thank you in advance for your consideration. Now for some go-to webinar housekeeping items. You should all see the go-to webinar viewer, which contains both the presentation slides and the webcam view. If you are on a computer, this is to the left of your screen. If you are viewing on an iPhone, you will need to swipe left and right to switch between the presentation and the presenter. On your computer, the control panel is located to the right. If your control panel collapses, the orange arrow allows you to expand it again. On the tablet or phone, the control features are at top or top and bottom. If you have a technical question for Aaron or myself, you can type that into the questions panel during the presentation. If you have a question for Brad, we ask that you hold those until the question and answer segment at the end. We will review the raise your hand feature at the start of the Q&A segment. If you experience a decrease in bandwidth during the lecture, you can choose to watch the webcam view or just the slide presentation view. Audio continues on either screen. Tonight, we are so pleased to have the Discovery Center's own Brad Bertelli presenting. Brad joined Key's History and Discovery Center upon its inception in 2013. He earned a master's degree in, of fine art in creative writing from the University of Miami in 2001. Upon moving to the Keys, he quickly embraced the unique and expansive history of the Upper Keys, with Kin Indian Key being his favorite. He is a published author of four books about the Keys, plus two on the Net Netflix TV series, Bloodline. Brad, welcome. Virtual handshake. Virtual handshake. Hello, thanks for, for tuning in. I know we have a, a big group out there and I'm super excited about that. My day is not to 
talk with my hands because uh, I tend to gesticulate quite a bit. And uh, so I'm going to try to keep that to a minimum during this, this presentation. All right, let me give me a second here. I'm really excited to talk about this subject. This is, this is my favorite topic in the Florida Keys. I don't know why I got so excited about Indian Key, um, but I have. I, I, there's so much history wrapped up in this, in this little island, and I'm thrilled to be able to sit here and uh, spread some, of, some, some more uh, stories of, about my favorite island. Um, so today we're going to talk about death at Indian Key, an unusual Indian attack. This occurred during the uh, Seminole War, during the second escalation of the Seminole War. And, um, and let's get started. So this is a kind of a, this is how most people see Indian Key. Um, as you're driving over the bridges be between Upper Matacumbi and Lower Matacumbi Key, uh, Keys, as you look you know, uh, out towards the Atlantic, you see this, this little island out, out in the Atlantic Ocean, which looks like nothing. Um, as you're driving past. But once upon a time, this was the largest community in the Florida Keys that was not named Key West. All right, a little overview of the island. Um, it's in, like I said, it's in the upper Keys, about a mile offshore of lower Matacumbi Key. If you want to give it a mile marker, mile marker 78-ish. Um, it's a small island, uh, about 11 acres total. Um, the early settlement period, the early settlement period, which is one that I'm going to be talking about, was from about 11, uh, 11, from uh, 1824 to 1840. Um, today, it is the uh, the Florida Keys' only real ghost town, and it is also uh, uh, Indian Key uh, Historic uh, State Park, which uh, it became in 1971. Um, it's a great hidden hidden secret in the Florida Keys, and we're going to explore a really fascinating uh, part of that history. Now, these are um, this is an aerial of Indian Key, uh, as well as if you've not been to our facility. I know a lot of our, our viewers tonight have this is their first time to interact with us, and this uh, the picture on on the left is of a model that we had made that shows how intricate this island was. It's hard to imagine um, when you're on the island today that it is. Uh, that, that once upon a time it was such a large developed community and this was this was one of the very first uh, projects that we did here at the, at the Keys History and Discovery Center and it really is an amazing model on the left really shows you how developed this island the island was in its heyday it was probably it was you know, had a, had a uh, population of about 140 people um, and today is uh, the picture on the right is more kind of an accurate uh, image of what it looks like today, although that's a pretty old picture. All right, so what we're going to delve into is one of the things that the island is best known for, and that's the Indian attack on, uh, on, on, Indian, on Indian Key during the Seminole War that happened on August 7th, 1840. At that time, there were about 50 people living on the island. Um, the Indian chief, uh, Chikeka, attacked the island uh, with a hundred, the number of people of, that attacked the island is, is, is unclear. Um, 100, 130, somewhere in that, in that number. Um, they, they arrived in 17 canoes. Um, they landed about two o'clock in the morning. Um, there were seven deaths associated with the attack, and it remained the southernmost attack during the Seminole War. We're going to get into a lot of different aspects of, of, of the attack why it happened, how it happened, what led up to it happening. And we are going to uh, dive into that just about now. Now, one of the great, there's lots of misinformation about Indian Key, which might be the reason that I'm so uh, involved with the island and, uh, and study it so much, because I want to set this, you know, because there, there are a lot of stories about the island and not all of them are, are accurate. One of the uh, primary stories about the attack itself blamed this gentleman here on, on, the, uh, on the screen, who is John Jacob Hausman. Um, John Jacob Hausman was born in 1799 in Staten Island, New York. Um, as a young man, he uh, took his father's 56-foot uh, schooner of William Henry. Some people say he stole it. Uh, there, was no, there was no real evidence of that or any evidence at all of that. But he did come, uh, come to the, Set a course for adventure. He wanted to 
find something. The uh, rivers of, 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 of New York, um, of Staten Island area, didn't, weren't enough to contain him. He want, had wild oats to sow as, as a young man. And about age 22, he came down to the West Indies. We know that he was in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822. And after Charleston, he uh, sailed further down to the Keys uh, through, along the Florida Straits. And he did encounter the Florida Reef, at which point uh, his ship wrecked, as so many sailors did in those days and still occasionally today. And he ended up going to Key West um, about 1822. So that was, you know, uh, very early on in the history of, of the island. And he learned all about the wrecking industry. And he understood uh, as he was there what a he was a schemer by nature. He wanted to make money. They were making a lot of money in Key West. Key West would become the uh, most, uh, the richest city per capita in the state, um, all, all on the back of wrecking. And he wanted to uh, become a wrecker. He wrecked, he, he was a wrecker down in Key West for, for several years before he wanted to um, develop his own little wrecking empire. And he chose Indian Key. And we'll talk a, a little bit about that later on. Um, but one of the big stories out of uh, out of the out of some of the newspaper articles and some of, and some of the accounts was that the reason that Chikeka and the Indians attacked Indian Key was because he put a two hundred dollar uh, bounty on every head on, on every Indian head. Um, this was a proposal that he made to the Florida Territorial Council. Um, it was never acted on, and that uh, was not the reason why the Indians attacked. Um, Jacob Hausman was part of the problem, but for different reasons, and those reasons we're going to jump into in a, in a minute. What a lot of people don't realize is that Dr. Henry Perrine um, also suggested putting a bounty on, in, on the heads of, of Indians in order to quell this uh, this, um, this, this, um, this, 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 the second escalation of the Seminole War. Only he suggested $500 a head. Um, and now the, the, the picture that we're showing are all survivors of the attack. These were all, these three were Henry Perrine's children uh, going from left to right. That's uh, Sarah Perrine, Henry Jr., and then Hester Perrine. Um, and we will talk about their story later on. Um, What's great about this family is that uh, Henry and Hester, Henry Jr. and Hester, both later in their lives would write their memoirs, telling a lot of a lot of stories about their time on Indian Key, which gives us some great firsthand insight about what was going on on the island. Now, the real culprit for why the Indians attacked Indian Key were because of Hausman, but because of his general store and his warehouse. Um, if you consider the Indians for what was happening, they were not after people when they attacked Indian Key. They were after supplies. They were after gunpowder and munitions and, 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 and musket balls and food and clothing and, and all these things that they you know, were in need of to survive. And um, the image on the left is the general store uh, that was always well provisioned. The warehouse too was well provisioned. And over the course of the, the mid to late 1830s, uh, the warehouse was utilized by the US Navy as a place to store some of their munitions and gunpowder and, and, and some of their, of their you know, things that, that they used during, during the war. Um, now this is a kind of backs up that point. This is um, a, a quote from Isaac Mayo, who was one of the, one of the Navy officers who was in, in the area of Indian Key during the late 1830s. And he writes a letter to the Secretary of the Navy, J.K. Paulding. Um, I consider the post of Indian of great importance for should the Indians capture it, they would, uh, they would be abundantly supplied with ammunition and arms, also a large supply of, of provisions. And that is the underlying reason why Indian Key was such an attractive place for the for the Indians to attack. And what should be made clear is that prior to the instigation of the second escalation of the, of the Seminole War, the Indians were common traders on the island. They were there frequently to trade at the general store. So they, 
they were well aware of, of the island as a whole, how it was set up, um, where the general store was, where the warehouse was, what the general store contained. It had clothing, it had munitions, it had food, food staples, it had um, uh, liquor and brandy and other things. But the real reason, um, but so how things get started uh, with the Second Seminole War. And the Seminole War is considered the largest, most expensive um, engagement in US history. And um, what happened is that in 1835, President Andrew Jackson invoked the Indian Removal Act of 1830 that had been presented by um, President Monroe, namesake of, our, of Monroe County here, back in 1830. And this was put into effect to make sure the new settlers in, in the country, in, in developing country of, of the United States, were kept safe as they began to settle, you know, settle this early portion of, of America. And what the Indian Re Removal Act did was um, made, uh, was an act to remove all of the Indians that were east of the Mississippi River and move them west of the Mississippi River to the Oklahoma area where they would be, giving, be given new lands. Now in 1835, President Jackson, or yeah, President Jackson reinvokes this, this, um, this, uh, uh, this act and, and it, becomes, um, it becomes illegal to be an Indian in the territory of Florida. Now, what occurred to me is, you know, some people don't realize how important that statement is. It, is. it is illegal to be an Indian in the Florida Territory. And this was um, a place where Indians had called home for generations. You know, this is, we were, we, you know, America was invading their territory. And this analogy came to my mind um, earlier today. And it would be like the president declaring that all residents of the Florida Keys who were of Bahamian ancestry were now deemed illegal. They could no longer be in the Florida Keys. So all the Currys and the Russells and the Pinders and the Alberries who've been here for generations were now deemed, were now being kicked out. And Aaron Muir, who was a seventh generation, I'm guessing that number, um, sixth generation, she's giving me a hand sign, sixth generation, you know, of, uh, Florida, her, her family is from the Bahamas. All of that heritage, all of that history is now being thrown out the window. And it is now illegal for her family, who's been here for you know, well over 100 years, um, is, now has to leave because they, they're being told to leave. Go to Kansas. We have to make room for Canadians to come down here and, and make room for them to live. So if you, if you can think about that, you can kind of understand why the Indians were outraged at being told to have to abandon their, their homes, their, their places where they've grown up and their fathers have grown up and their grandfathers have grown up. Now, the Second Seminole War, there were lots of skirmishes before the attack on Major Francis, Francis uh, Dade on December 28, 19, 1835. Um, but this was the primary impetus of the escalation of the Seminole War. And Dade had been sent to Tampa Bay, to a fort in Tampa Bay, with, and he was told to um, march with about 110 soldiers and other, other individuals to Fort Brooks, which, or Fort, I'm sorry, Fort King, which is near the Ocala area. And they marched for days and days. And then on, on December 28th, um, as they were, uh, as they were passing, the, this little picture kind of depicts what's happened. In the early morning, the uh, soldiers are walking two by two. It's cold. They have their, their, um, their, uh, uh, their cloaks on so their, their guns are not easily accessible. And what happens is these Indians have lined on each side of, of the trail that led between the Fort at Tampa Bay and Fort King. And early in the morning, all of a sudden, the, the, these volleys of, of shots ring out. And of the 100 and, approximately 110 people in that procession marching to Fort King to you know, help to build, to help fortify that undermanned fort are killed. Um, so, and there are three survivors. Now, 
Now, following, following this attack, which doesn't really affect the Florida Keys and the Indian Key, um, on January 6th, there is a second attack. And the other, and by the way, the the attack on, on December twenty eighth on on on, uh, on on Major Dade that was a there were actually two attacks that day that was a coordinated attack. So they attacked the column that was marching to Fort King, but they also attacked Fort King at, at the same time, um, which was not un, unusual, you know, to have these these you know these coordinated events. Not the first one first one that we're going to talk about, um, but on January sixth. It says the New River, there's attack at, at New River. And New River is actually Fort Lauderdale. And there was a settlement there, which is really the largest settlement between Daytona Beach and Indian Key. And the only, uh, the only uh, plantation, the only home that was attacked was that of, of a man named Cooley. And um, he lost his wife, he lost uh, his children, um, his mother and sisters survived. But this terrified the people of of the New River area. This you know, this attack that was you know this brutal attack, and um, everyone from from the uh, from the New River area, as well as the settlements at the Miami River, all left. And first they went to the Cape Florida Lighthouse and kind of gathered there. And from the Cape Florida Lighthouse they went to Indian Key. And when they arrived at Indian Key, they brought their stories. They brought these horrific tales. Of, of what they witnessed and what had happened, which made the people at Indian Key nervous. This was the Seminole War. They'd heard about it, you know, on other accounts and as of, of it happening outside their realm. But now it is, you know, now it's coming to their island. And they're hearing these firsthand accounts of, of, of these, these things that people witnessed, of these deaths. Um, and so as they arrived at, at Indian Key and tell their stories, um, our good friend John Jacob Hausman, who had spent thousands of dollars, many, many thousands of dollars of his own money developing Indian Key. He was trying to make it his own wrecking empire. Um, he developed, you know, he um, built shops, he built uh, wharves, he built a warehouse, and he um, had the most to protect and the most to lose. And when he wrote letters to the to the you know to the governor to the secretary of the navy asking for help, he was largely ignored. So what he did was he uh, developed his own his own militia, Company B, the 10th Florida Militia. And he every able-bodied man man on on Indian Key, there's 24 of them, both um, whites and and slaves, were en en enlisted. And uh, for, they were paid for a 40 days, you know, for a 40 day period from this initial period, uh, 30 cents per day, 50 cents per diem. They were also um, given arms and munition from, from Hausman's general store and his, his stores. And also there was six cannons that were arranged around Indian Key. Um, and the story is that once a day, one of these cannons was fired every day just to let everyone know that they, the island was that was fortified. Now, Hausman paid for this out of his own pocket, not because he was a generous guy, but because he thought that that the army and, and the government would repay him, um, which never happened. Um, but this was in this was his response. This was Hausman's response. Now, one of the Florida delegates for the territorial uh, legislature was uh, Colonel Charles Downing. And what he wrote in a letter, um, he visited Indian Key in January of, 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 18, uh, in, in, of that year, 1836. And he wrote, in January, 1836, I was on Indian Key and found a wall around it, built of every sort of material imaginable necessity could furnish. A vessel belonging to Jacob Hausman was prepared with portholes, a bulwark around the decks and armaments and moved a short distance from the island as a place of refuge for the men and women in the event of a successful attack. So they were taking every precaution they could because they wanted to protect their livelihood, their lives. And if the government wasn't going to assist them, then they were going to assist themselves. Now, oops, 
Now, the Indians were accustomed to coming to Indian Key, and it wasn't unusual to, to see them before 1835 to have an Indian come to, to the island was just an everyday thing that would, would have raised no suspicion. Um, but after the attack at, at, on Dade's men, after the attack at, at New River, um, after all the stories kind of coming into the island, you know, tensions had risen and people were on edge. So in mid-March of 1836, um, the men, the people of Indian Key watched a lone Spaniard, an older gentleman, approaching the island in a canoe. They found it suspicious because they understood, everyone pretty much understood at the time, the government suspected um, that the Spanish from Havana, from Cuba, were helping to supply the Indians with arms and munitions in order to, to fight the US government. And, and so this Spaniard comes onto the island, and as soon as he comes onto the island, he is approached by the Florida militia, he's taken into custody, and he is interrogated. And at first, he talks about, I'm just here to trade, I just want to come trade, that's all I'm doing. But as the interrogation increased, he began to break and his story began to change. And he finally admitted that he had brought two Indians with him and had left them on one of the outer islands in the area. Um, and uh, so he agreed to help a, uh, the Florida militia, uh, Indian Key, find these Indians. And they formed a sort of posse. Um, Think about a posse, you know, from the uh, a Western you're watching when they're all on horsebacks and, and they're riding off to, you know, to, to, to find these fugitives. Um, in this case, they didn't use horses, they used something more appropriate. They got in boats and they found the two Indians on Lignum Vitae Key and, and, uh, and took them into custody, brought them back to Indian Key and interrogated them. Unlike the Spaniard before, the two Indians were more than happy, even, bo even boastful about what was being planned. <clears throat> and they had suggest, they had said there's a large number of Indians in the Cape Sable area, and they're planning attacks on Indian Key. They're, 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 <laughs> they're planning attacks on, um, on Key Vaca. They're planning attacks on at Key West, which was very alarming. And, and, uh, and Hausman wrote a letter asking, you know, and sent it to, to Pensacola to, to, uh, to uh, Commodore Dallas at, in, in Pensacola, again, asking for help, asking for backup, for government backup, which was slow in coming. But in the meantime, March, April, May, this Spaniard and these two Indians were held in custody, put in irons and held in custody. Now, in May of 1836, the revenue cutter Dexter arrives and anchors off of Indian off of Indian Key, and when they do, uh, w when the government ship arrives, they take the Spaniard and the two Indians, and they hand them over to the officers aboard the Dexter. Now the Dexter only stays for several weeks. They depart in in in, in mid June, um, but the day before the Dexter pulls up their anchor and leaves, um, suddenly the, the Spaniard, the old man Spaniard, he dies. He's been in custody for, for months, for, you know, for two months basically. And miraculously, on the very day before they leave, the two Indians escape their chains. And they both are able to jump overboard from the Dexter. And as they swim away, one of the Indians is shot and killed as, as he tries to escape. But the other Indian does manage to escape and does get away. In the meantime, there are a new series of attacks that become localized in the South Florida area and begin, begin, and begin to inch closer to Indian Key. Um, the first attack it's on July 23rd, this is 1836, at the, at the Cape Florida Lighthouse. Um, the lighthouse is destroyed. There are two men at the lighthouse at the time. 
The lighthouse keeper, John Dubois, has uh, fortunately for him gone to Key West to visit his family. So he's safe in Key West, but there's an assistant keeper and a handyman who are there. Um, the assistant keeper is, uh, is shot and killed. The handyman is, he's shot and wounded um, and does end up being rescued and brought to Key West uh, where he, where he is you know, patched up and then goes, I believe, to Charleston, where he uh, uh, continues to, to, um, to recover and, and, and lives till another day. Now, on October 5th, there is an attack at Garden Cove. Now, Garden Cove is an important area. Um, there is, this is before Carey's Fort Lighthouse is, is constructed. There is a lighthouse, a light ship that has been anchored um, off of uh, Carey's, Fort, uh, Carey's Fort Reef. And this light ship is there to mark Carey's Fort because it's a very dangerous, a very dangerous uh, reef. A lot of ships get wrecked there. Um, there is a, a, a stat, a, 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 a um, stat that says 25% of all shipwrecks are assigned to Carey's Fort Reef. Although to be fair, Carey's Fort is somewhat of an umbrella term for all uh, Upper Keys and Key Largo reefs. Um, I see my hands are going up again. Let me keep those down. Um, but Captain John Walton, is, who's in charge of the lighthouse, understands that staples and food delivered to his ship aren't, you know, always on time. So he um, and, some, and some of his men develop a garden at a small cove on Key Largo, which is, you know, now known as Garden Cove, where they are raising fruits and vegetables and things to subsidize their, um, their food stores on, on the boat. But on October 5th, a group of, of, of Seminole Indians um, ravage the, the, uh, the, the garden and destroy it. And um, so that's happened October 5th. Several days later, probably the same guys, the, the same Indians um, attack. There's a schooner that is at, 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 at um, anchor off Tavernier Key, um, which is off of Key Largo, uh, south of, of, of you know, on, on the, a southern, southern end of, of Key Largo. Um, there are five men aboard aboard the schooner, they all escape on, on their smaller auxiliary boats. Two of them are wounded, but they all survive. The Indians loot the ship and burn it. Um, and then, you know, sometime later uh, on, on June 25th, 1837, um, John Walton's family has actually come from Key West to uh, visit him on the light ship. And Walton and four of his men take one of the long boats and they go to Garden Key to get some charcoal there. And when Walton arrives and, and the men, they are greeted by a couple of Seminole warriors. Um, Walton is shot and killed. Another man who is with Walton is running back, trying to escape, can be back on the boat, on the long boat to, to escape to safety back on the light ship. He is shot in the back and he's killed. Um, both of these men are, are, are scalped. The story is that of uh, John Walton, that one of his fingers was cut off so the Indians could take one of his rings. But there um, is a man named William English, who was a wrecker, uh, who was living on Indian Key, um, who would also become a state senator, goes to, goes to uh, uh, Garden Cove and retrieves the bodies and brings them back to Indian Key. So now this is renewed fear and, and renewed understanding of how real this attack in the, 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 the Seminole War is. Um, now, during the, to the time of the attack on, on Garden Cove at John, that kills John Walton and, and one of his crew members, um, and the attack at Indian Key, there are several instances of government ships and gun barges coming to the island, coming to, um, to uh, Indian Key and anchoring off Indian Key. Um, in 1838, uh, Hausman's uh, Company B, 10th Florida Militia, is disbanded because there is now a government presence near the island. Um, and around October uh, 1838, there is a naval depot that is created on nearby Tea Table Key, which is about a mile from, from, from Indian Key. Um, this naval depot um, is there. It's initially uh, described as a boathouse and a storehouse of thatched palmettos, not very exciting, not very you know extravagant, but it, it's named Fort Paulding after uh, 
Paulding, who was the Secretary of the Navy at the time, there is talk that had he known that the fort named after him was such a small, and, and Titeo Key is, is about three and a half acres, it's a very small island, um, he probably wouldn't be too thrilled to have the fort named after him be such a small thing. But in December of 19, 1838, um, Dr. Henry Perrine and his family arrive on Indian Key in, uh, on Christmas Day in 1838. And Perrine, who is a, a He's educated, he's smart, he um, has this in very interesting uh, observation about, about what Lieutenant Cost, who was the man who, was, who, was, um, who creates Fort Paulding on, on Indian Key, on, on, sorry, I'm sorry, on Tea Table Key, has this very interesting um, observation. He says in a letter, be it understood Lieutenant Cost occupies and claims this key as his own. From the fact that since September last, he has been clearing it, improving it, and building on it with government means of men and materials. That he is converting, converting said tea table key into a town site for a rival port of Indian Key under the apparent patronage of the inimical proprietors and public offices of Key West. Now, of course, there's lots of backstory here, and that'll probably be another talk on Indian Key that I'll give at a different time about how they were making a bid to make uh, Indian Key, a port of entry, which would have greatly harmed Key West. There were actually three attempts at that, but that's another story for another time. Now, the Indian who attacked, the Indian chief who led the attack on Indian Key was a, 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 a not a Seminole Indian, but a Spanish Indian chief named Chiqueca. And there has been a lot of stories about Chiqueca. I came across some wonderful research by Dr. John Wirth from the Department of Anthropology at the University of West Florida from Pensacola, who has spent a lot of time in Havana as well as Spain studying Calusa um, uh, archives and, and learning about the Calusas Indians. Um, now, in his studies, what he came across was a a Spanish Indian chief named Antonio. And Antonio was a tall, six foot, probably a little taller, well-built, muscular, strong leader. He was also a captain with his very own ship. Um, he would come to the Florida Keys, or to the South Florida, and ended up having a uh, his island hideaway in the uh, Big Cypress Swamp. Um, it, it was a it's a tree island. It's actually you can see it if you're traveling on I-75. You can actually see this island. Um, but it, it is Chikaika who organizes. Um, he only has really two appearances in, in the Seminole War: um, the attack on Indian Key on August 7th and 1840, and a attack before that that happens at the Caloosahatchee River um, in 1839. Hmm. Now. The attack, oops, the attack at the, at the Caloosahatchee River, the first, and this is the first time that Chiqueca, otherwise known as, as Antonio, but in, in the parlance of the Seminole War history in the, in the South Florida history, um, is identified as Chiqueca. Um, this is where he first, his first, his name first enters the lexicon. And what happens is that uh, William Selby Harney, um, takes 25 uh, soldiers, as well as a couple of interpreters and several uh, men who are going to travel to the Caloosahatchee River to set up a, a, a trading post there. And they travel, it, it's uh, said 15, 20 miles up the Caloosahatchee River. They ended up in what is today uh, uh, Cape Coral, Florida. And they set up, they dock there, they come ashore. They start to build the uh, the um, the uh, what's it called the trading post, and about 300 yards away there is the camp for the for the uh, the soldiers. Now a couple of days after they arrive and they're building the building the trading post and that that's all getting going, on the other side of the river and it's a pretty broad river. I'm not sure if you if you're familiar with that area, but it's it's a wide expanse. But a number of Indians create a camp on the other side of the river. And there are two groups of Indians. There's the, the Seminole group led by, and I'm gonna probably butcher this guy's name, Hospitarque, as well as, and he's leading this, 
the seminal band of, of, of these Indians. And there's also Chiqueca, who, was, who has his Spanish Indian component. And there's about, 100, about 160 of, of these Indians on, at this campsite on the other side of, of the Clusahatchee River. And they're there for several days. And then on the night of July 23rd, or the night of July 22nd, actually, um, or the 23rd, they have a big party, a, a, a big dance. They're burning the fires. They're having the dance. The Indians are. And then about 4 o'clock in the morning, they come across the river, and they attack Harney and his men. There are 13 casualties uh, killed. Um, Harney escapes with his life. He's asleep. He runs off in nothing but his night clothes. Um, and there are six people taken hostage or, or taken captive. Um, two of these men are then uh, are then killed at the Indian attack. They're taken back to the Indian campsite on the other side of the river, and two of these men are killed. Um, and they um, sit there for several days. And this becomes the third most successful attack during the course of the Seminole War. Now, a couple of days after the attack, Harney shows up on Indian Key, um, and, and uh, Henry Prine Jr., Henry Prine's son, writes in one of his memoirs or, or writes, talks about uh, Harney showing up, nothing but his night clothes, on a turtle schooner, and he, um, you know, he ends up living to talk another day. But and, and we'll get to, get back to Harney in, in a little while. Um, but from there, let's move on to uh, kind of get in, in the story to uh, John T. McLaughlin, who um, was born in 1812 in Baltimore, Maryland. He joins the Navy at, when he's 15 years old. In 1837, he's wounded he, at, at an attack at Fort Mellon. He's shot in the chest by a musket ball. Takes him about six months to recover. He's a very ambitious young uh, man and climbs in the ranks fairly, you know, fairly quickly. And in 1839, he is assigned command of Fort Paulding at Tea Table Key. Now, at this point, Fort Paulding is pretty well developed. It's um, it, it's there's a pretty good military presence there. Uh, Hausman has disbanded his, his his militia, so there is a lot of um, you know, tensions have been assuaged. There's you know a, a false sense of security with, with this military uh, presence nearby. Um, and McLaughlin is is given this order on December 2nd from the Secretary of the Navy. Um, he is told to furnish himself with a sufficient number of flat bottom boats and in addition to these procure a likely sufficiency of long plantation canoes. By this means, the department cannot but hope he will be able to penetrate the Everglades further than any white man, surprise and capture the Indian women and children, and thus end the war that has cost so many millions. Now, we know that, that McLaughlin has been ordered to strike out to the Everglades and try to capture Chiqueca and these Indians and put an end to the hostilities. Now, they could have gotten a break. Um, in July of 1840, a man named John appears at Fort Dallas, which is at the Miami River. And he approaches voluntarily. He tells them he's been held captive by the Seminoles for four years. And he also tells the officers at Fort Dallas that Chiqueca is planning to attack Indian Key. Now, there's a couple problems with John. Um, they, do, they don't believe him. Hey, he's black. They think he's an escaped slave. They think he's a spy. They don't believe what he's saying. They put him in irons and they take him in custody and put, and put him in jail. Now, McLaughlin hears about this and travels up to Fort Dallas and tries to have the men at Fort Dallas release John to him. And John's very, very um, uh, eager to help and wants to help tries to explain where Chiqueca and his men are, are hiding, where their, their camp is. And the officers at Fort Dallas will not release John to McLaughlin's, um, you know, uh, to McLaughlin to help guide them. But McLaughlin is allowed to sit down and talk to him. And John does his best to describe where in the Everglades, you know, the Everglades are vast and expansive and 
you can't, you know, there's not, not a lot of road markers there to, to give guidance. But, um, but McLaughlin does lead an expedition out to the Everglades and spends a week looking for Chiquica's tree island. Uh, it's unsuccessful, he doesn't, the men are exhausted after a week and they end up returning home to Tea Table Key. This would not be the last time that McLaughlin and the men of Fort Paulding and, 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 and are out there trying to, to, to find Chiquica. Um, now in late July, Chiquica and his men leave their hideaway, their hideaway in, in, in the Everglades and they travel, um, they paddle down I want to say 30 miles. I'm not sure how long it is by, as a crow would fly, um, but it takes them about six days to paddle from from, from the Everglades, and they um, end up staying at Lower Matacumbe Key for several days. Now, there are theories and stories that suggest that they have been given um, intelligence that that there is something going on at Fort Paulding, and that there is going to be another launch, another off offensive into the Everglades. Now, on August 3rd, Henry Prine and his daughter, Sarah, Henry Prine at this point has a little garden on, on Lower Matacumbe Key. And no one's expecting the Indians to travel to such a great distance to attack Indian Key. Fort Paulding is there, they're feeling safe. And Prine takes his daughter for a lunch over to what he calls a fairy grotto that he's discovered on Lower Matacumbe Key. And this is, I'm gonna, this next slide I'm gonna show is a really kind of beautiful uh, description of what Sarah writes about what she sees at this fairy grotto. He, her father, soon brought me to a spot where he parted the branches and there was a fairy grotto. In the center was a small sparkling spring, perhaps 10 or 15 feet across various cacti in bloom and fruit with other flowers upon the banks. The overarching trees interlacing their boughs while innumerable air plants in full bloom added brilliancy to the scene, the sun scarcely penetrating. Now what they didn't realize as they were enjoying their lunch in this beautiful, beautiful little, little area on Lower Matacumbe Key was that 100, 120, 130 Indians were on the island waiting to attack Indian Key. Um, now on August 4th, 1840, McLaughlin writes to the Secretary of the Navy, Paulding, and says, Lieutenant Rogers in the wave, another Army, another Navy officer, sailed today with 18 canoes for Cape Romano on the western coast. Touching on his passage at Tea Table Key, for provisions and to take off all the people capable of quitting the hospital for another attempt to cross the Ever Everglades from that vicinity. So on, so uh, Rogers departs on the 4th, he arrives at Tea Table Key on the 5th or the 6th, um, uh, it takes all the men who are capable from, the, uh, from, from Fort Paulding, which also has a Navy hospital on it, and leaves only a handful of men behind. Midshipman Murray and a couple other nurses who are tending to some wounded and some, some of the soldiers who are suffering from, from yellow fever or malaria. Now, what happens is that on August 6th, this second offensive in the Everglades departs Tea Table Key, heading to, to Cape Romano, which is in, in the Marco Island area. And as they depart, these Indians who are on Lower Matacumbe Key watch the island, watch them leave. Now, on August 7th, 1840, is when the attack occurs. And this is a, a picture, an overview of, of the model we have downstairs at the museum. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, um, the beach area is where these Indian, Indian canoes land at about two o'clock in the morning. Now what happens is there are two men in, in these, in, in living in, the, in a, a couple of these, these small cottages. And this is a pretty deserted area of the island. But James Glass has a hard time sleeping that night and wakes up and steps outside to get some fresh air. And when he does, what he notices 
is this line of Indian canoes lined up on the beach. He goes to his neighbor house, Mr. Biglet, and they tells him what's going on and Biglet grabs his shotgun and they try to make their way across the island to warn Jacob Hausman. As they're traveling behind their houses to that fence line where the palm trees are, they encounter Indians who are crouched and waiting for a chance, the time to attack. The Indians see them. One of the Indians stands up and turns to shoot his gun at Biglet. His gun flashes but does not fire. And Biglet lets out a mighty scream of terror, fires his shotgun, and then all the chaos begins. Um, the island is, is an uproar of Indians that are attacking. They make their way to, uh, some of them make their way to Jacob Hausman's house. They're coming, and Jacob Hausman and his wife are, are upstairs. The Indians are coming downstairs. Hausman and Anne, his wife, manage to escape out, out a window, and they're barefoot, and they end up running across the sharp coral of the island. They go out to the water in their night shirts and they're waiting in the water, hiding. Their two large dogs come bounding after them and they're barking with all the excitement and they're all out in the water. And the dogs are about to, you know, potentially give away their, 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 um, their hiding place. And Hausman takes the heads of the dogs and holds them underwater and drowns them and kills them. Um, and Hausman and Anne eventually survive. They make their way to Tea Table Key and live to tell their story another day. Dr. Henry Perrine and his family are in the Perrine house here. Um, it's a two and a half story house. The cupola is up on top. Um, there is a bathing house underneath the house, a bathing area. And the family, Mr. Prine, his wife, his three children, all gather in the room downstairs. There's a trap door in, in the room downstairs, and they are going to hide underneath the house. But one of his daughters had been sick, and as they go down the steps, she puts her foot in the water down, downstairs and leaves a wet footprint on the steps. And Henry Prine does not want to leave that kind of hint about where they're hiding, what, where they are. So he tells his wife and kids, you go downstairs, I will stay up here. Um, he covers the trap door with a, a seed chest and, and the family hides under, underneath the house. Henry Perrine, the Indians come. Perrine, who can speak Spanish, they speak Spanish, they also speak some English. Um, Henry Perrine reasons with them this first attempt and the Indians leave. Perrine goes up to a, the third story in the cupola and the Indians, after some time, return and they are breaking through the trap door that leads to the cupola. A shot is fired. Perrine is killed. His family is downstairs listening to this whole thing. They end up making their way to the turtle crawl, which is that long extension hanging down. The turtle crawl, back in the days when there was no refrigeration, the best way to keep your protein fresh was to keep it alive. Uh, turtles were kept in here. The boards that, 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 um, that, were, that, that uh, bordered, bordered the the dock um, were wide enough apart to allow for a free exchange of fresh water um, for aeration and such, but they were too narrow for the turtles to escape. But this is where the, the family huddled. And then the house begins to burn down around them. Um, embers are falling down. They end up putting you know, uh, grass and marl on top of their head you know, to try to protect themselves. Henry Perrine Jr. finally says, I'd rather take my chances out there than burn alive in here. And he and his mother end up working one of the posts um, enough for him to squeeze through. He ends up crawling out, coming back to the, uh, to the dock um, because the Indians are, are beginning to, to leave and, and to move, move on. And, um, and uh, his family escapes. And they all go to end up going to Tea Table Key and the family survives. Henry Prine does not. So all in all, there are seven casualties of this attack. Dr. Henry, Henry Perrine, the Mott family, who suffers the most personal loss. The father is killed. The mother is killed. Their newborn child is killed. Um, their daughter is killed. 
their mother, their seven year old mother does survive. Um, Joseph Sturdy, who escapes with Biglet, another sailor, um, they hide in the, um, in the cistern below the Housen's warehouse. Um, but that building is set on fire. And as it begins to burn down around them, um, the, the three men who are in the cistern, or the, the, the two men and the, and the, the boy Sturdy, um, Biglet and the other man um, end up, are able to slosh their way through the cistern and, and escape. They are burned, their hair is singed, and they have burns. Uh, the, the boy, Joseph Sturdy, probably succumbs to smoke inhalation before he dies and, and, and is burned up in the cistern. There is a seventh casualty, a slave boy, um, and that is the result of the attack, the seven people who were killed. Now, in the aftermath of, of this attack, Henry Perrine is buried on Lower Matacumbi Key near the ferry, uh, the ferry grotto. In later years, they would go, go back to try to find, find where he was buried, it never could be found. Um, there is a, uh, a ceremonial um, monument, tombstone to him up in New York, where he's also buried. Um, Hausman and his wife would move to Key West, where he would suffer his own fates a year later. And Indian Key becomes a military base. They move from, the military moves from, from, from um, uh, T. Table Key to Indian Key. And that becomes a military base of operations through the end of the war in 1842. Now, the things that make this an unusual attack during this war, A, the Indians crossed a, a large body of water to get there. Um, they attacked at night. And this attack on Indian Key becomes the first time in the history of the war where the Indians actually found, took one of the cannons on the island and fired back at some of the people over on Tea Table Key. And that's what really makes it, that's one of the things that makes it an unusual attack. Uh, to this point, I think we're going to uh, wrap up and take questions for anybody who has them. Karen? All right. Thank you, Brad, for that wonderful presentation. This is Erin Muir, and I'm going to be moderating our question and answer segment. So if you would like to ask a question, you may use your raise hand button. I will be able to see everyone who has a hand raised and will call on you to ask your question. When I call on you, I will unmute your microphone. When I do this, you should get a notification that says something along the lines of, the organizer has unmuted you. Would you like to unmute and select yes? If you don't see this notification, you can always check your mute status by looking at your microphone button. If there is a slash line through it, then and you are muted and it's red in color in many devices. A microphone with no slash and green on many devices means your mic is on for everyone to hear. If someone else asks your question or you change your mind about asking your question, hit your raise hand button again and it will lower your virtual hand. Or you can always type in your question in the questions panel like we reviewed at the start of the webinar and I will read your question to Brad. I'd also like to draw your attention to the questions panel because during the presentation, I sent you all a question. If you have more than one person watching on your device, please uh, take a moment to respond back in that chat with the total number watching. All right, let's go ahead um, and give this a shot. And let me take a look at all of our questions here. I see we have I will start with one that was submitted actually by Nancy. Nancy would like to know why did settlers choose Indian Key? Indian Key was really remarkable in the sense that there were really four reasons why it was such a remarkable island. Um, at the, it was midway, point, midway along the Florida Reef, so it was convenient for the wrecking industry. Um, there was a freshwater source on nearby Lower Matacumbi Key. Some people call that, there were like five freshwater wells, basically in the parking lot of which Robbie's bringing it today. They were considered some of the most reliable freshwater in all of the Key. Um, perhaps a great reason why Indian Key was 
a prominent location, was to have the re reputation of being relatively mosquito free, um, which would be a great thing in those days. But it had a general store. Uh, it had, it was the only general store between, you know, Key West and and Fort Lauderdale or, and beyond, basically. So it was a very neat location. It had some um, uh, necessities, it had fresh water, no mosquitoes, had a general store in it so there were people who could get their, you know, their belongings. A lot of people coming in um, with trade. So there were a lot of a, a lot of good things with Indian Key. I hope that was clear enough. I'm not sure that it was, but. Okay. We have Russ Steele who has a hand raised. Russ, I have unmuted you. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, I found the presentation very helpful and thank you for doing it. Um, I live in Isle Marauder and I always, I saw the plaque for Indian Key, but I learned a lot more listening to you. Um, is it true that, how long was it the county seat? Was the Indian Key ever the um, county seat for day? It was in, 18, in 1836. Um, Richard Fitzpatrick, who was the state senator representing uh, the newly formed Dade County, um, who had lots of interests in the Fort Lauderdale area, which is why he, one of the reasons I think he, um, he uh, lobbied to have Monroe County split up into, into two counties. In those days, Monroe County stretched from Key West to Lake Okeechobee to Fort Myers, basically. Um, and, which is kind of interesting. One, one of the big reasons for the reason that it was split up was that it was inconvenient for people in northern parts of Monroe County to have to go to Key West twice a year for jury duty. And so they uh, decided to make Monroe County into two counties. Uh, the Bahia Honda was basically the split line for north of Bahia Honda in Dade County. And because Indian Key was the largest community in the newly formed Dade County at the time, it was declared the county seat. All right, now another question. We actually have two folks who have asked a question along the same lines. Um, Jerry Lieberman and Kelly McKinnon have both asked a question about the name Indian Key. Was it named Indian Key before the attack? Kelly's comment is, shouldn't we have seen this coming? <laughs> The first time Indian Key shows up on a map, on a chart, is 1775. And there are three names for the island listed in 1775. It is called uh, Matanza, which is, which is its earliest name. It's called Cape Comfort, which is the Bahamian name for the island, and also called Indian Key. Um, there are no reasons that I've ever seen why it was called Indian Key. It was probably because um, it was a place where Indians you could come and trade with them. So it's probably a, a place where, where, because Indian Key was utilized by European sailors from the 1500s on, on because they would come to Indian Key, get fresh water, and that would come be very conveniently uh, located, and then probably a place where they could also trade with Indians early on. But it was 1775 was the first time that the name Indian Key shows up on a chart. All right, Melba Tomeo has a hand raised. Melba, I've unmuted you. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Very informative. I wondered if you felt that Haussmann has been treated unfairly uh, in historical accounts or by his contemporaries. That's a really interesting question because there is no doubt that he was dubious of character. He was... Um, out for himself, and he was a, a, a schemer. Um, but what also people don't recognize about, about Hausman was that he was a man of action. He was a man who could put a plan in, into effect and, and, and see that could come to fruition. So he did have a lot of bad qualities, and he historically ruffled Key West feathers because he was not the kind of a guy who would go along with the status quo, but wanted to make his own place in the world. So, but he, you know, as a rector, he did lose his license because it would be typical behavior of Hausman to, as a rector, you had to bring your 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 cargo to to a port of entry. That would be Key West. But if there was a wreck at Carrie's Fort Reef on Key Largo, for instance, on his way to Key West, he would often stop at Indian Key and offload some of the cargo. There was never a counterpart after the fact. So he definitely had some schemey qualities to him, 
and even in, 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 in letters from people on the island, from Charles Howe, for instance, on the island, who lived with him at the time, he was known as being a schemer and being not above board. But he should also be recognized as a man who um, could get things done. So there was, he was the first land developer in the Upper Keys. And he put his money where his mouth was. He invested about $200,000 developing Indian Key. So you know, to his own benefit, yes, but he had qualities. Um, but he also had some, uh, some dubious character, character traits as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I see that Peter Jutro, I apologize for pronunciation, uh, has a hand raised. I have unmuted you, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I really enjoyed that uh, presentation. Thank you very much. You said one thing in the last minute or so of your talk that puzzled me. I, I don't know if I misheard or you accidentally said something you didn't mean to, but you said that Henry Perrine, after his death, was buried at Ferry Grotto on Upper Matacumbi, but there's a memorial stone in New York where he's also buried. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> well, after the attack, his children and his family um, wanted to bury him. And they did go to I'm sorry, Lower Matacumbi Key with a, near the Ferry Grotto, and he was buried with a, with a gravestone on Lower Matacumbi Key. Um, his family went back later and tried to find that gravesite and never could. But there is a, a, a gravestone in New York where his family went to after the attack that is kind of, that, that memorializes him, but there's no body there in New York, just the gravestone. Thanks, <laughs> that makes perfect sense. I just, All right, thank you. The idea of being buried in two places at the same time was no, no. interesting. <laughs> All right, so we have, go back up to my hand raises here. Jim Duran, I have unmuted you. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, again, uh, very good uh, presentation. One of the stories I heard, and I've, I've been down here for many, many years, was that they tried to come over from Tea Table Key with a, a gunboat and they didn't have the proper um size shot or whatever is did you hear anything about that when they were trying to help them after the indians attack yes there there are there was um two gunboats the people who left were left at, 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 at fort Pauling on tea table it was just you know um uh midshipman murray and a couple of, of nurses um or people were trying to nurse the, the um sick and injured back to health and there was a a, um, there was an effort to, to try to attack the attackers. And they did have two gunboats that pushed off from the Gable Key. Each had a small uh, carronade, a small cannon. Um, but they were attached quickly and not very, not very well um, on, on these barges. And each was fired once. And when they were either stuck with too much powder um, but or, and not affixed to the gunboat, um, but the but the cannons did did um, uh, recoil off off of the off of off the gunboats. Aaron, can you put my presentation back on real quick? Is, is that a problem? No. I do have a picture of I do have one of those cannons that I'll show you that was recovered from the water there back. That is called the Cooley Cannon. Oh, and wow. this, was, this was one of the cannons that was um, jettisoned off the gun barge. There was two of these. They were taken from a ship that was wrecked in 1835 called the Gill Blast, about nine miles north of, um, of, um, of, um, of Fort Lauderdale, um, of the New River. And they were uh, recovered by Cooley and brought back to Indian Key in, 1830, in 1835, 1836. And these were the two. This is one of the cans that was that was recovered uh, between Tea Table and Indian Key. Great, thank you. Well, I've heard that story for a long time. It's a, it's a true one. Thanks, Aaron. All right. All right. Let's go to another question.
question that has been typed in. Let me see. Rick Johnson would like to know how many buildings were burned. How many buildings? No one knows for sure how many buildings were burned. Um, the only thing that's ever said in, in, in the record books or in the histories is that many of the buildings were burned. Um, so there's no, I, I know that, um, let's say there's 50 buildings on the island at the time, 50 buildings on the island. I know that how the, the Howe property, he had uh, one, two, three, he had six or seven buildings on his, his property that were not burned. Um, I'm not sure if the hotel, tropical hotel was burned. I don't think that it was. I know the bowling alley was not burned because it was used um, in the 1850s um, by uh, during during the second the third escalation of of the Seminole War, um, where uh, the Indian or the, where the uh, military personnel would stay there. So there's never been a a a, a solid number given, but, it, but there there were some buildings left. And then after and then after the attack. When the military came back from Tibiable Key and established Indian Key, they spent about twelve thousand dollars redeveloping the island and building. There's the round systems out, out there on the island that were built after the attack. There were um, barracks uh, constructed for the uh, the military personnel. There was a hospital that was um that was created that was built. So there were several buildings built after after the attack, but there's never been uh, an assessment or a number of how many were burned during the attack. Okay, so another question that has been typed in, and I'm going to combine these two from Kat West. Um, she is questioning the legality of the bounty on Native American lives and also is wondering when the Indian Removal Act was revoked. Um, whether or not it was legal or not doesn't really, it was never, it was just an idea that how it floated in a petition to the territorial uh, um, congress it was never acted on so it, was, it, it never became it was never a thing it was just an idea he floated that was really ignored um so that never came to fruition it's just something that he Hausman had lost um, his wrecking license he had lost business at his general store he was going bankrupt he had spent about ten thousand dollars financing uh his florida militia and so he was just looking for any way to make to make a buck and he said hey for 200 bucks you know I'll get rid of all the Indians for 200 bucks a head, but it was never acted on. It was totally ignored. And as for the second part of your question, I do not know um, when that removal act was, was removed. I know um, up until the third escalation of the Civil War in the 1850s, it was still illegal to be an Indian. And finally, the, finally for the Seminole and, and the Miccosukee, who, who ended up you know, never being defeated, Basically, the India, basically the government just kind of gave up and said, "Fine, we we give." Um, but I'm not sure when that was ever overturned or when they moved on from there. All right, uh, we have a question from Elaine Schulberg. Uh, one of your slides referenced Fort King, and she would like to know where that is. Ocala, All near right. Ocala, <laughs> and. Now I will go to a question from Bob Thomas, who would like to know where the Cooley Cannon is now. That's a really good question. Um, we don't know where. I can't think of the the man who discovered it. I, I, his name escaped. The man who salvaged it name escapes me right now. Um, his he has since passed. I believe his son has the cannon and. There was an effort to purchase the cannon by a group up in, um, by Bob Maynard, I believe, his group up, um, I want to say Fort Pierce area, if I'm not positive. Um, and if Bob, if, if you're watching, I apologize. Um, but there were, we were hoping to able to bring that cannon to our facility on a temporary basis. I, had, I did reach out to the Sun um, a year or two ago asking if, if we could, you know, display it, I never heard back from him. But so it's somewhere in the state of Florida, but don't know where it is. We would love to have it here, though, even All right. temporarily. 
we've got a few more questions that have been typed in, but first I'm going to go to another raised hand. Alan Rappaport has a hand raised. Alan, I've unmuted you. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes. Um, the, you imply that the Spanish were complicit in attacking um, by giving weapons to the Indians. Can you expand on that? There was concern with the military that the Spanish who were friendly with the Seminoles were bringing, were smuggling arms from the Bahamas and from, and from Cuba in like fishing boats and, and helping to arm, arm the, the Indians. Um, these like Chiqueca and the Spanish Indians were also, you know, um, were also, you know, had, had come over from, from Cuba and, and were, there were fishing rancheros along the Gulf Coast where um, these camps where people were fishing and salting fish and bringing back to markets in Havana. And these were banned by, by Cubans, also by, by Spanish Indians. Um, I, there, was, there was, one of the reasons that McLaughlin was, um, rose in, in, in his rank in the military was that he had the ear of, uh, of, of the Secretary of Navy, J.K. Paulding, because the normal, the normal um, uh, uh, boats that were being used to try to stop these, these uh, fishermen uh, coming over from the Bahamas and from Cuba were using big, the, the wrong kind of boats. And it was McLaughlin who suggested using smaller shallow draft, shallow draft boats, kind of like Porter did with his mosquito fleet he was trying to uh, defeat the, the piracy in the West Indies. And in fact, McLaughlin referred to his, his fleet of ships as the Mosquito Fleet as well. And these were smaller craft of ships that could be better navigate the shallows around the island. Um, but they were, you know, this was another way of, of, of helping, you know, the Indians and the Seminoles and the, uh, the, the Indians prior to the Seminoles coming down were friendly with with the Spanish and the last of, of the Aboriginals, the Tequesta and the and the and the Calusa actually ended up did going going to Spain, um, and, and kind of living there as a way to escape the other you know escape um, or the South Border. Um, there was already a bond between the Indians and Cuba. I'm not sure if that helps or not. That helps. That helps. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna do just two more questions. If you have submitted a question and we do not get to it, Brad will send you an answer to your question after the conclusion of the program. But Adrian Miranda would like to know, is it known where the first Garden Cove Lighthouse was? An approximate location, was it close to the present day Carries Fort Reef Lighthouse? were the oldest Key Largo sediment, settlements closer to modern day Ocean Reef? Um, wasn't, it was not a lighthouse, it was a light ship. It was a large two, two massive schooner with uh, like two lights on top that was anchored at Turtle Bay, which is near Paris Fort Reef. So that was to mark, it was to mark the, uh, the reef line. So it wasn't, it wasn't a lighthouse, it was a light ship. Um, there were, in Key Largo, I don't know about settlements up by um, uh, 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 Ocean Reef. I know one of the early, the, one of the early settlements um, was around Mile Marker 98 was Captain Ben Baker when he came and, and had a pineapple plantation up, up in that area. Um, I believe the earliest one I can think of is um, Planter in the 18, 1880s in the Tavernier Planter area as far, but I know that in 1870, Ben Baker petitioned to have the first post office, which was called Cayo Largo, and he, in his petition in, in 1870, was um, saying there were about, there were about 12, uh, house, 12 homes up, up in that area. Um, and that will be about my marker, 98, my marker, you know, that, that's where his plantation was. Okay, 
now this one i i'm you know i'd like to know the answer to too this is a great question why were there no mosquitoes on indian key now on indian key there's no fresh water and you need fresh water for in, for mosquitoes to to um to repopulate and also it's about a mile offshore and with the headwinds coming from the atlantic there you know it was they, they weren't able to cross that area as well now there were always some mosquitoes on the island um, but there was never the big, the big mass, you know, clouds like there are. Like, like even if, even today, if you go to Lignavitae Key, and even the rangers who are out there put on full bee suits, you know, in order because because the mosquitoes are so thick on the island still. And on Indian Key, still there are rarely, um, you know, mosquitoes. Sometimes there's, there's always some there, but there's no fresh water. There, it's located far enough offshore with that headwind to kind of hinder their their uh, their flight arrival out there, and once they they get out there, there's no place for them to to repopulate. So, I will then read one final question for you, Brad. This is from Robin Elder, and I'm going to go ahead and paraphrase because it's lengthy. But Robin is a fellow author who has written about Indian Key, as you know, um, and she's referencing Perrine's anti-seminal sentiments. And the idea of offering a reward of $500 for every Indian brought into the coasts of the peninsula. Um, her question is, was it Perrine or Hausman, who also had strong anti-seminal sentiment, sen sentiment, which man came up with the idea first? Well, I wouldn't say that Hausman had anti-Indian sentiment. He, he relied on them for trade early on. He, he was very friendly and um, and openly traded with them at a general store. So for, for for Hausman, it was just him looking to make a buck because he because all his avenues of, of revenue had been cut off. He couldn't wreck anymore. His general store had had lost a lot of its business because because of the Seminole War, and he was you know he he expended all his money and he was you know basically broke at this point. So he was just looking for a way to make money. Um, Perrine, uh, I don't know about his anti-seminal sentiments. I know that he um, he wanted his he came to the area to develop his tropical plant company, and he was told not to come here because of the Seminole War, and he was probably just anxious to get to work, and he was not able to to do that until the Seminole War was ended. And he was able, he would end up getting a, a land grant in what's called Perrine, Florida today, which is in the Cutler Bay area. Um, so he was stuck on Indian Key, you know, and, until, until the war was over because he couldn't do what his passion was, which was plants. All right, thank you, Brad. So before we sign off for the evening, as the membership manager here at the History and Discovery Center, I would be remiss if I did not remind you that our spring membership drive is still ongoing. We are so appreciative of all those who have chosen to join, reactivate, upgrade, refer since the launch of the drive on March 1st. While the membership drive continues, we are sensitive to the uncertainty facing both our local economy and personal household finances due to the ongoing health crisis. With that in mind, we have extended the timeframe of the membership drive through June 20th, and we will reschedule at a later date the drawing for our amazing Key West excursion. If you're interested in joining or reactivating, please visit our website, keysdiscovery.com. This lecture has been recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel. We'll be sharing it via our Facebook page as well. At the conclusion of the program, you all will be prompted to take a brief survey about your experience with tonight's lecture. We value your feedback and would love for you to take a moment and complete the survey. The survey will also be sent in a follow-up email in case you'd like to complete it at a later time. If you're on our email list, you will receive an email with the registration link for our next lecture on Wednesday, May 13th. That email will go out the Monday before the lecture. Registration links are also currently available on our keysdiscovery.com website and our Facebook page. 
Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And don't forget to tune in to tomorrow's virtual visit with Brad via Facebook Live tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and our first field trip this Friday, virtual field trip, also at 10 a.m.